uh, Nashville. Uh, everybody watching, I, I see a lot of you guys have joined already. We're looking at Florida's in the house, not just us Tennesseans. We're looking at South Dakota, a bunch of people here tonight. We're so happy that you're with us, uh, church family, right? Because we're all church family, whether we're Life Story Church or we're just the body of Christ, wherever we are. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here. Uh, a bunch of you guys uh, joined us yesterday for uh, my video announcement. I'm so thankful that you guys did. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of uh, uncertainty happening right now in the world with the, with the possible uh, uh, shutdowns of, of uh, quarantines, uh, uh, social distancing, all of this stuff. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the world and there's a lot of fear going around. Uh, I, sh I started, um, I started uh, my announcement yesterday by showing you guys a picture. Uh, it's a picture of Bible, sh uh, Bible shelves at a Walmart. Can we see that picture? This is a picture of Bible shelves at Walmart. Empty shelves. We're used to seeing empty shelves now, aren't we? But, but this isn't the toilet paper aisle. This is the Bible shelves at Walmart. There is so much uncertainty in the world right now that people are looking for answers. Are we in the last days? As a pastor, I'm getting all kinds of questions, uh, emails, text messages from a, a bunch of you guys who are probably even watching right now. Are we in the last days? Uh, the sermon title uh, that we're going with today is simply this. Uh, coronavirus and the end, end times question mark because I hope to answer I hope to take you guys through the Word of God and show you guys where we find a lot of uh, the answers to a lot of the questions that I've been hearing that you've been asking is this revelation that we're witnessing is this plague this COVID-19 is it the pale horse rider of revelation is this the end of the world as we know it well, we're going to get to that tonight, guys. So I hope you've got your Bible. I hope you've got your Bible because we're going to move through a lot of scripture today. We were preparing this message all the way up right until the last, trying to get as much content in here as we, as we can. Uh, you know, we've got, we're blessed in a way, uh, we're blessed in a way, normally if we were in a facility, we might be more limited on time, limited on time with our child care workers and everything else like that. Because we're online, we're not so limited on time. I'm going to try to keep this at around an hour tonight, guys, but I want to go through a lot of scripture and I want to answer a lot of these questions that you guys have been asking the questions that are causing a lot of fear in our communities today because you have an opportunity you have got a unique opportunity at this time in history to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to share the knowledge that he has given you from another time domain all right dimensionally this book has come to us from another dimension as sci-fi as, as that sounds right we know that God exists in spirit we know that we can't see the spirit where we are right now, but we know that he's there and that's where this book came from. He's given us the answers to quell the fears of our nation and to encourage people that are feeling scared and feeling lost. There are so many people right now in the country, in our realm of influence, that are more open to hearing the gospel than ever before. They're more open now than ever before to hearing the gospel because they're looking for answers. So, And I know a lot of you uh, watching this right now, you're looking for answers yourself. Well, I want to equip you and arm you tonight with those answers for yourself, but also so you can be an encouragement to others and you can more effectively share the gospel, okay? So I hope you've got your Bible. I hope you've got a cup of coffee. We might need more than one tonight, all right? So we're going to begin right off the bat. Open your Bibles with me, please, to Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. And while you're looking for that, let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We ask you that you would open up our minds to your word this evening. We ask you, Lord, that as we read these scriptures, you would show us things in your word that we've never seen before, or perhaps we'll see them in a way slightly different, slightly in a way that we never have before, that will, that will inspire our hearts, God, and that will equip us for the days ahead, equip us for the ministry of building your church and following after you, Jesus. We just dedicate this time to you tonight, and we ask that you would have your way with it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, I can hear you. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. I'm going to spend a lot of time in New King James tonight, and I'm going to spend some time in King James as well. For nation will rise against nation, 
and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, there will be pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. We read that scripture, and we look at the times that we are living in, we are living in nation rising against nation, break that down to the Greek, that's ethnic group rising up against ethnic group, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, Pestilences, that, incl- that includes plagues, that includes sickness, church, earthquakes in various places. That means earthquakes in places that they normally aren't, normally aren't. Have, have we been seeing along with this uh, COVID-19, coronavirus stuff, all of that, have we also been seeing strange things, uh, oddly uh, uh, active volcanoes, oddly active uh, plates in the earth. There are earthquakes in the center. There, when I was a kid, there used to never be earthquakes uh, anywhere but Los, An- Los Angeles uh, and overseas, certain places in the country and in the world that frequently had earthquakes. We're having earthquakes in New York. We're having earthquakes on the New Madrid Fault now. We're having earthquakes all over the place, I would say in diverse places. So is this that? Is this time that we are living in, Matthew chapter 24, Revelation chapter 6, we're going to spend time in Matthew 24 tonight, we're also going to spend a lot of time in Revelation, okay? Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 reads, and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death. This is one that I've been getting a lot of. Could this be the pale horse rider of Revelation that we are witnessing? And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Is this that? Pale, that word pale in the the original Greek, it also means green. It means, uh, denotes sickness as well. Is this, this plague that we're looking at, is, are we seeing that Revelation chapter 6 happen on earth right now? Well, to answer these questions, the first thing that we have to do is build a framework for your understanding of Scripture. Now, we teach that we want to rightly divide the Word of God. We want to study the Word of God in context. I don't want to take one verse out of a chapter and throw it onto COVID-19 and say, it's the pale horse rider. No, we've got to study this verse in its context, just like we're going to study uh, Matthew 24, verse 7, in its context tonight, okay? But first things first, like I said, we've got to build a framework for your understanding of scripture. What do you expect is going to happen? Oh, Christian, church, what do you expect to happen at the end of the world? What do you think that the Bible is telling you? One of the most important things to understand isn't simply what is going to happen, church, but it's also to understand when do these things happen? When do these things happen in Bible prophecy? Okay, what, as far as a timeline goes, okay, so let's build the framework here. Let's build the framework. And the Word of God is nothing if it isn't a book of prophecy. We hold in our hands a book that one out of every five verses, four to five verses, is prophecy. Prophecy that has either been fulfilled or prophecy that is going to be fulfilled, okay? So can I see our, our prophetic uh, scripture uh, uh, graphic? prophetic scriptures. Here we have, in the word of God that we have possession of, there are 8,362 predictive verses in this book. There are over 1,000, there are 1,817 straight out predictions and 737 separate matters encompassing them all. This is a book of prophecy, church, okay? We hold we hold a book of prophecy, not things that are just done. It's not just a book of history, okay? So within that, co- that framework, with understanding that, the most broadly accepted understanding of Scripture regarding when certain things happen comes to us first in the book of of Daniel. And we're going to read Daniel chapter 9, so you can look at that. But before we do, I want to look at this, and I'm going to give you an outline of Daniel uh, chapter 9. The famous 70 weeks of Daniel. We, we talk about this prophecy uh, every Resurrection Sunday, every Palm Sunday, because this was a prophecy that was partly fulfilled by Jesus' first coming in 32 AD. I believe it was 32 AD. Um, 
Daniel chapter 9, verse 4. It gives us the scope. I want you to, if you're, take a, if you're watching on your phone or on your iPad or on your desktop, take a screenshot of this picture because I want you to look at it tonight as we study through uh, Daniel chapter 9. The 70 weeks of Daniel, t- verse 24, will give you the scope. Verse 25 explains out for you 69 weeks. And then there's an interval, interval in uh, verse 26, and then the 70th week is outlined uh, and explained to us in verse 27, okay? So let's just go ahead and read that, and I'm going to explain it to you a little bit as we move along here. So uh, it's hard for me to explain it to you before I give you the scripture because you won't know what I'm explaining. So let's just read verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for your holy people, for your people, for your holy city, to finish transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right, did we, did we get that here? That was the scope. He's giving you the whole scope in that first, uh, first verse. Seventy weeks are determined. Now he's going to break it down a little bit more so for you. This vision that Daniel is receiving, this prophecy that he is receiving. Verse 25, therefore know, therefore, know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. In other words, 69 weeks. But for some reason, it's, it, the, the, the Holy Spirit is giving this to us in parts, okay? There shall be seven weeks, then 62 weeks. Let's keep reading. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Okay, so there we have the 69 weeks given to us there. And now let's read verse uh, 26. After the 62 weeks, remember it was 7, then 62, so here we are really after 69. So the Holy Spirit is showing us that in this timeline there are going to be breaks, there are going to be intervals, okay? There's a lot of conjecture as to what uh, the the 7 to 62 interval means. I'm not going to dive into that tonight, uh, but it's a good conversation to have over a cup of coffee. The main one I'm focusing on here is after the 69th, okay, we see in verse 26, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. After the 69th, that's before the 70th. So we see two breaking points, two intervals there. That word cu- uh, cut off in the Hebrew is the, is the word karat, and it means execution. It means the death penalty. It means executed. The Messiah shall be executed, but not for himself. How powerful is that, church? There it is, the prophecy of Jesus on the cross uh, uh, hundreds of years before he would arrive on that Palm Sunday. And again, I'm, I'm going over this to help us build a framework. I'm trying not to go too deep into this. We will go deep into this on Palm Sunday. So uh, if you're a prophecy uh, lover, student of prophecy, you're not going to want to miss our Holy Week teachings, okay? Let's keep reading, though. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Most scholars uh, understand this to be uh, breaking this word down into the Hebrew. It means uh, a a river overflowing its banks, a spreading out. They believe this could be referring to the diaspora because what happened, what happened, church, uh, after the Messiah was cut off in 70 AD when when, uh, they destroyed the city city and the uh, sanctuary, okay, when the Romans came, the Romans came, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple. Uh, they weren't supposed to destroy the temple, but they did for the, they, as the fires raged in the temple, it melted the gold in between the stones. So they threw one stone off of the other to get the gold out. Fascinating. We're, I can't get off on that rabbit trail, though, but it's, it's powerful prophecy right there. Remember, Jesus said one stone will not be left on another. And even though there was an order given to not touch the temple, it happened anyway because it was God's will. All right. So, (coughs) excuse me, 
After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be executed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come, the prince who is to come, is a reference to Antichrist, and we'll get there in a little bit, okay? The prince to come, the people of the prince to come will do this destruction, and who did it? The Roman legions did the destruction. So many people believe that, that there will be a Roman tie to the Antichrist somehow. But again, I digress. Let's keep reading. And, it, and uh, the end of it shall be with a flood, despora, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And now we arrive at verse 27. Remember our uh, outline, the 70th week we're going to find right here. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Remember that? Put a pin in that. I'm coming back to that. But in the middle of the week, what would be in the middle of a week? How many days are in a week? Seven days. So what's, in the, what's the halfway point of a week, right? It's, it's three and a half. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. A week in... Uh, 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 in, in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, in regards to prophecies and whatnot, they considered they considered seven uh, years uh, to be a week. A day is is a year, so a week of years is a term that you'll often see if you're studying Bible prophecy. A week of years means seven years, and so here we see in verse 27. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, for seven years. Can I see this next graphic? That means uh, uh, in the Hebrew, times, times, and half a times, okay? Times equal, uh, equals uh, dual, later lost in Aramaic. In other words, it means it, it, you break it down, and it means one plus two plus half equals three and a half years, okay? 42 months. Keep that in mind. We're going to see these numbers again and again as we study Revelation, as we continue our study tonight. 1,260 days, half a week, okay? We see, we see all of these numbers. So we are awaiting right now after the Messiah was cut off, okay? We, saw, we, we see quickly that this prophecy becomes dual in nature. It's a prophecy about Jesus being cut off, yes, in that 69th week, but then he says certain things are going to happen. The people of the prince to come destroys the temple and the city. That happened, church. And there was a diaspora. That happened. But then the rest of this has yet to happen. So there's a number of, uh, of things in this scripture that has yet to, to happen. So I it's my belief that this is a prophecy that is dual in nature. It's about what happened then, but it's also about what's going to happen in the future, uh, in, awaiting that, that 70th week, that final seven-year period. I believe after the Messiah was cut off, because you can't look at the seven years that followed Jesus' crucifixion and say that just another seven years happened right after that. Because all of this stuff wouldn't happen until 70 A.D. So it wasn't in, in the year uh, 39 uh, A.D. that all of these, this other prophecy happened. No, it wasn't until 70 A.D. that some of it happened. So I believe it's dual in nature. We see those intervals in this prophecy. What I'm driving at, church, is I go through all of that with you because I don't want you just to take this, uh, take my word for any of this. We are awaiting still the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Uh, you know, we know then, uh, we know then uh, what is coming, that that seven-year period is coming at some point, is what we are living right now is, are we in that seven-year period? Okay, that's, if people, if you're asking, is coronavirus the pale horse rider? It, is uh, this the end of the world? Is this the, you know, is this the end times now? Is this what we're happy, what's happening, what we're seeing? I've gotten, uh, um, Emails and questions from some of you guys saying, you know, this vaccine, if there's going to be forced vaccinations, could forced vaccinations be uh, the mark of the beast, that sort of thing as well. Uh, now there's a new report out that I saw uh, 
uh, today that said uh, a microchip that Bill Gates is involved with creating somehow. He believes that that could somehow aid in treating the coronavirus. I don't know how that works. And my mind just doesn't even understand that stuff. Uh, it's inc incredible what science is able to do today. But in any case, these are questions that I'm getting. So we're building a framework, okay? So. There will be at some point a 70th week coming, a seven year period when pro the rest of this prophecy of Daniel is going to happen and when uh, some things in Revelation are going to happen, as we'll see. So is this it? Can I see that uh, next graphic? Asher, I believe there's, yes, here we are. Uh, take a screenshot of this on your phone or your iPad or your computer. Uh, if you've never seen this, I think this is a graphic that truly does help you understand. Um, I didn't build this graphic, so thanks to whoever did. I found it on the internet years ago. There are different theories as to uh, you know, how rapture is involved uh, with the 70th week of Daniel, when it will come. Some people believe in a pre-tribulational rap uh, rapture, the tribulation period being seven, seven years that Daniel spoke about. Uh, is it a mid? Is it a pre-wrath, post-tribulation? And then the second coming of Jesus. Definitely we know the second coming of Jesus uh, happens when he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives, and that is at the very end of this 70th week. So is there a rapture that happens before Jesus comes here where we meet him in the air? And we'll get to that as we continue to study tonight uh, as well. And we'll touch on some of that since we have unlimited time, right? So... Um, Let's read, let's read uh, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to move into Revelation now. You guys ready? You ready, Asher? <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got a captive audience here of my, my children and uh, close friends, so it's a good audience to have. Um, right, let's read Revelation chapter 1, verse 18 through 19. I'm going to go old school. I'm going to read the King James Version, okay? I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and of death church who do you think is speaking right now anybody comment on the thread if that if, if you if, if this is hitting any bells for you Jesus is speaking to John John the revelator at this point of opening of revelation Jesus then says write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be after. Don't let this be lost on you now, okay? Uh, this is a divine outline that I'm showing you right now, a divine outline that was uh, written out by Dr. Chuck Missler. The things that thou hast seen, the vision of Christ, chapter 1, Chuck, with his incredible insight given to him by the Holy Spirit, uh, came up with this outline, and I believe that it was a gift to him from the Holy Spirit. We see just in this one statement that things that thou hast seen, the vision of Christ, go tell, write down, write down, uh, Jesus is saying, John, write down, write a letter, tell them what you've seen, they've seen you, and the things which are. And then what are the things that which are within that context? The churches, the seven churches in Revelations chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He's going to write these letters to seven churches that I believe the spirit of those seven churches are still uh, alive today. And the things which shall be hereafter. Hereafter, that which follows after the churches, verses which encompasses verse 4 through 22, and I'm going to show you why, why uh, I believe that that is the correct interpretation of things. Hereafter, in that scripture, in that scripture, verse uh, 19, which show those things which shall be hereafter is the Greek word metatauta, which means hereafter, or in other words, after these things. So after these things. So he's first declaring who he is in chapter 1, and then he's uh, giving instruction and uh, uh, warnings to the churches. And then uh, uh, lastly, we see uh, the things that will be hereafter. After what? After the churches. So let's read Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through 2, if we could. Verse 1 through 2. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice 
The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, or in other words, come here, and I will show, th show thee things which must be hereafter. So declaring himself who he is, then writing instructions to the churches, and then what happens all of a sudden, Jesus uh, says to John, come up here. And suddenly he's in the throne room of heaven. Immediately, verse 2 says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. One sat on the, any guesses who sat on the throne? God Almighty, uh, how incredible. From this point forward, church, from this point forward, uh, we don't see the church on earth in Revelation. Does anybody have any ideas uh, why that would be? From this point forward, as we read and as we study Revelation, we see God referring to uh, those who dwell upon the earth. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you know that when you study the letters of Paul and even in the Gospels, Jesus, when he refers to his sheep, he refers to them as, well, sheep. Paul refers to the Christians and to the church as beloved there are always words that are endearing. Here, after, after the letters to the churches are finished and John is brought up, hereafter, brought up uh, uh, into the, the, the throne room, essentially, there's no more references to the church in those at all, I believe, because from here on out, it's earth dwellers, those who dwell upon the earth. This is, this is the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble, when God begins to directly deal in a climactic way with Israel. He begins to deal in a climactic way with the earth, with the wickedness in the earth, when judgment comes to the wicked of the earth. Israel, and that what we have to understand here, church, is that... You know, there's, there's replacement theology abounding uh, in the church today. People want to say, well, we have been, gra not only have we been grafted in to uh, uh, Israel uh, through the faith of Abraham, but now all of the promises that were meant for Israel are now our promises, and that's anything but true, church. There are promises to the nation of Israel that are yet to be fulfilled and have got nothing to do with the Gentile church, okay? So... The rest of Revelation from this point forward, in my understanding, is God dealing with Israel and the rest of the world. Does anybody have a guess as to why the, the uh, beloved bride is not mentioned in Revelation after chapter 3? Go ahead, write your comment below. Does anybody have a guess as to why the church would not be uh, mentioned uh, in Revelation after chapter 3, now let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. I'm going to read the King James Version. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Uh, are you picking up on a theme here? What did we just read in Revelation? Come here, come here. And next, and immediately John was in the throne room of God, right? Well, here we see, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That word caught up is the Greek word harpazo. Harpazo. It means forcibly snatched up. The Latin version of this word is rapturo, and it's recorded as such in the, the Latin Vulgate. And that church is where we get our word for rapture. So I've seen many conversations on Facebook, on different threads, on prophecy websites uh, that say, you know, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. I don't know why these people think they're going to be raptured one day. It's not even in the Bible. It is in the Bible. This is where it comes from ling lingually here, right? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, we shall be raptured together with them in the clouds. So this suggests a meeting with Jesus that will take place, church, in the clouds. That is, 
decidedly different from when Jesus comes at the end of the seven-year period and puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives, okay? There are a couple keys here. Don't miss them. Don't let anybody tell you. And if you're taking notes, don't let anybody ever tell you that the Bible doesn't say rapture because we just learned that it did, that it does, right? And what did the Lord descend with? He descended with a shout, with a voice, and with a trump. That is a shofar blast, not the president, I'm sorry to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 reads, read it with me, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for we, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed, church. The last trumpet here denotes that it's time to leave. How cool is that? Uh, Time to leave. In the Hebrew culture, whenever the camps... Whenever the camps would uh, uh, mobilize, remember they traveled through the desert, uh, setting up the tent of meeting, and they would, there's a whole other teaching on that I can't get into for time's sake, but as they would travel, travel from place to place, whenever they packed up and they were about to head out, then that trumpet would sound, church. In other words, it's time to leave. It's time to move out. Many early church fathers uh, also were... Uh, uh, believed in a rapture that we would that in a pre-tribulation rapture uh, they because they believed the word of God was literal if you read the word of God and you read these passages and and you uh, don't believe that it's all allegory the only way that you, you're either reading this uh, from a position of, of that it's literal and taking the word of God literally or you think that a lot of this is allegory Well, the first uh, early church fathers, many uh, believed in a pre-tribulation rapture, uh, and I don't know that I'll have time to get into much of that evidence uh, uh, tonight. I've got a bunch of it for you guys, but let me just give you one. Let me just give you one quote, if if I could. Uh, Ephraim of (laughs) Nisibis. I don't know how to pronounce that uh, properly. Anyway, Ephraim of Nisibis. In A.D. 306, 306, 373 to 373, in that time period, he wrote this. He said, he said, for all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of their sins. This sermon was titled, On the Last Times, the Antichrist and the End of the World. That's one heck of a sermon title. I was joking with uh, Andrew earlier, and I said, you know, um, I almost uh, called my sermon tonight COVID-19 and the end of the world. But we thought we thought maybe it sounded too much like a bad uh, uh, B-level uh, Hollywood movie from the 90s. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it'd be hard to it'd be hard to outdo on the last times the Antichrist and the end of the world. But there we see Ephraim doing just that, laying out everything that I'm trying to explain to you guys and show you in Scripture tonight that that there is going to be a seven year tribulation. Okay, and those who uh, studied Scripture even back to the first century, the the disciples of the disciples believed in a seven that the word of God should be taken literally, and they believed in a seven year tribulation. Okay. And that a rapture of the church was going to come at some point, and the vast majority of writings that care to even mention it uh, state their belief in a pre-tribulational rapture. Uh, in my studies, uh, I've seen it over and over again. And we might just have to do a study on the rapture now that we've been given uh, this time to have unlimited time uh, to a degree uh, with home studio video recording services. So maybe we'll talk about the rapture next week and I'll get to, into more of uh, that early church father stuff. Uh, but let's, I want to go issue by issue now. So now I've kind of, we've kind of built a framework, right? What did I say from the begin, beginning? You've got to build a framework for your understanding as far as when you're studying uh, prophecy and scripture. You know, okay, we don't want to just know what's going to happen, but we need to know when it's going to happen so we can have an understanding of what we're looking for exactly. Because if you don't know, if you know what, but you don't know when, you might be 
still terrified, right? If you don't know when this is going to happen uh, in, in relation to the seven-year tribulation, in relation to a rapture, this can be some frightening stuff to read. But let's go issue by issue with that in mind, okay? Uh, question by question. Uh, one of the questions that I received earlier in the week was the pale horse rider. I mentioned that at the beginning of our service tonight. That came to us from Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. So let's just read that. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. This is the green, pale, sickness rider. This one, uh, this is the one that has got a lot of people afraid and a little uneasy. Maybe this is the one that's got people buying all the Bibles at Walmart right now, okay? I'm just going to answer this one very simply for you guys, okay? If we understand, if we understand a rapture event happens at some point, if we understand at a seven-year tribulation period, which is when, uh, uh, if we understand a seven-year tribulation period, um, and we understand that chapter four represents a rapture event that uh, that I believe mirrors the rapture event in First Thessalonians chapter four. So we've got rapture event in First Thessalonians chapter four, and then we've got a rapture event uh, that is mirroring, mirroring in type and shadow. Uh, and the first verse of chapter 4, just let me ask you this question. When does this pale horse rider ride? What chapter is he riding in? He's riding in chapter 6, right? Is that, so let me ask you this. Is that before or after chapter 4? It's after, isn't it? So the pale horse rider that rides and is released by Jesus, by the way, remember who opens the seals of these horsemen. The one who opens the seal is Jesus himself as we study scripture, okay? And so that comes after this event in chapter 4. Does that give you guys a little bit of peace of mind right now? All right, I hope so. Let's keep reading. Uh, what we're seeing right now with the economy collapsing because of this virus, you know, it looks like a lot of balls are in the air right now. We've got, we've got sickness, we've got plague, we've got, uh, we've got the economy looking like it might be collapsing. And if the economy collapses with the stock market and all of this stuff, we've got uh, 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 government, uh, uh, our government in turmoil with uh, uh, with our president and those who seek to uh, uh, undermine him. And there's talk of coups and silent coups and all this and that. Uh, the global elites are definitely moving. Whatever whatever uh, is going on with this uh, coronavirus stuff, they're definitely not letting uh, an opportunity go to waste. What, what did Rahm Emanuel say? He, he said, never let a good crisis go to waste, right, in regards to uh, their uh, plans for the nation. Uh, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. So if you're not familiar with that stuff, uh, I think it's something we need to look into. In any case, uh, one world religion, one world religion, one world order, one, uh, uh, all of this stuff. Are we seeing uh, you know, those who want a borderless world? They're, they're trying to make advances, trying to attach things to this bill. There's so much chaos in the world. Let's just read that verse. We're going to look in Revelations chapter 13, verse 5 through 8, and answer a couple of these things. Because I have also gotten some questions uh, from you guys um, asking Asking, you know, the vac with, with the uh, Denmark is now forcing vaccinations, right? They're, they have already passed the law to do forced mandatory vaccinations as soon as the coronavirus vac uh, vaccine is available. So I've gotten uh, messages from you guys saying, could this be the mark of the beast? Well, let's just read through this, okay? Let's just read through this stuff, and I think you're going to get a lot of clarity and hopefully a lot of peace from it, okay? Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 through 8. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. 
and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Remember, way back at the beginning of our message, and now 38 minutes ago, if you can believe that, way back at the beginning of our message, we talked about uh, key numbers to look out for, right? The times, times in a ha half time, 42 months. There's that number again. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. I wonder who those who dwell in heaven might be at this point, considering we're in chapter 13 and considering what happened in chapter 4. Just, you know, side note. Uh, one thing I know for sure is that Satan hates you guys. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it if he was uh, blaspheming uh, 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 against those who dwell in heaven, uh, even when we're gone. Uh, verse 7. Let's keep reading. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay? And authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Okay? So there are still people here. Now, this one can be confusing uh, sometimes for uh, uh, people to say, well, I thought we were raptured. Then in verse 7, who are these saints here, church? There is going to be a seven-year period. Remember, remember, uh, according to the Talmud and according to Hebrew tradi tradition, we study this every year when we look at the, the different festivals, uh, especially the Feast of Trumpets, which comes in the fall. The the, the the Jews believed that uh, that on on the Feast of Trumpets that the books were opened. The book there was the Book of Life, the Book of Death, and then there was the Intermediary Book. Okay, and they believed that from uh, the Feast of Trumpets until the Day of Atonement, you've got a seven-day period to make your decision. So when those books are opened on the Feast of Trumpets, you've got the Book of the Dead, those who are, uh, who are wicked to the core. Uh, they hate God. They blaspheme God. Uh, they are of their father, Satan. They're already in that book. And then there's the Lamb's Book of Life, the Book of Life. But there's an intermediary book, according to tradition, that is opened as well. And during that seven-day period from... Uh, uh, Yom Teruah until the Day of Atonement. There's a seven-day period where people can uh, make make a decision for God. They can repent of their sins. Okay, so I believe this is type and shadow here. I believe that after a rapture event, there will be people left left behind after the rapture that go into the tribulation. People who per perhaps you have been witnessing to them for years and you've been saying, look, this is going to happen. Maybe you've even told them about the rapture, but you've told them about salvation and what Jesus did for them on the cross, that he's the son of God and that he loves them and everything else. And, and you try to get them to church, whatever it is, but one day is coming, but they refuse, they refuse, they refuse. But one day there's going to be a day when you're gone. In the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed from corruptible to incorruptible and we'll be with him, a catching up that is a different event from when he sets his foot down at the end of the seven-year tribulation, as we've covered, okay? And I think those people in those times, they're going to know where you went. And the Holy Spirit is going to, out of the kindness of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to reach out to their hearts. And I believe that there will be many who come to Jesus during the tribulation. Unfortunately, as you study deeper, deeper into Revelation, you find that the only way that they are to be saved in that tribulation period is to lose their life for Christ and to stand for him. But, but I believe this rever refers to the saints. I also believe those saints, end time saints, tribulation saints, as it's called. I also believe that the Jewish people, uh, that, as I mentioned early on, this period of Jacob's trouble for seven years will be dealing specifically with Israel, and those are still God's chosen people. God still has a deal with Abraham regarding his lineage, okay? So don't let that be lost on you. Verse 8, let's keep reading. All who dwell on the earth, there it is again, okay? Earth dwellers, not beloved, okay? Who dwell on the earth, they will worship him. Those who what? Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh, church, my goodness. There will be, a, this will be a time like no other time in heaven. He'll be slandering you know, there are so many false teachings that abound today, church. The political correctness is out of control. Uh, 
90, uh, recent Barna polls have said 91% of the people that are in the church today in America don't even believe in absolute truth anymore. The lie that there are many paths to God abounds and it abounds and it abounds. There is no better time in your life, however old you are, whether you're 19 or 41 or 61, whatever it is, to know the word of God and to hide it away in your heart so you can openly share it and understand, especially in troubled times. Let's keep reading. I want to jump over to verse uh, 14 through 17. Let's read. What are we seeing here? So uh, we just read verses 5 through 8, okay, and he make, where he uh, uh, makes everybody worship him. Verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Don't let that be lost, okay? That is pointing to a one world religion, and I believe that, you know, there are powers uh, at play today, religious leaders. Right now we see the Pope working with uh, Muslim leaders on, on bringing together some for, form of Chrislam, believe it or not, is the term that they use for it. They actually use that term. Uh, the Vatican is uh, building a religious center right now. I have, have plans to build a religious center with, for, in, in that religious center, separate buildings for all the three major religions of the world. They want a global religion. Well, let's keep reading, verse 14 through 17. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was, was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth, there it is again, earth dwellers, to make an image to the beast who was found by the sword and lived. So he, 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 he takes a blow and he lives. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. And the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So here we're seeing an antichrist and a false prophet figure on the scene during the seven-year tribulation period, okay? They're on the scene here. Uh, and he cut verse 16. And he causes all, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead. So this is where we get into the question about the vaccine, okay? Uh, verse 17, right hand or forehead. I don't know how a vaccine on the forehead works, okay? But let's just keep reading. And the one, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, underline that, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, all right? God is saying here is wisdom. Are you ready for it? Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So, uh, I, I, short answer, I don't believe that the mark of the beast is a vaccine. You know, I, now I, if, is it possible that they're utilizing this to set up a framework in which everybody has to forcibly take a mark in the future? Are they setting up the pathways, the organizational structure to get, to get it done right now? Quite possibly, all right? But if no business, no commerce can happen on earth without this mark. Now, this is interesting because uh, in, in uh, that... Uh, law that's passed in, in Denmark and other places, there is also conversation saying, look, we're going to have you in a database, and if you don't get this vaccine, then you're going to be uh, not allowed to be out in public. You're not going to be able to uh, you're, to buy, sell, or trade, and, and it's going to be a black mark on you. You're, you need to have, we need to have record of you taking this vaccine if you're going to participate in society. So that kind of rings some bells, doesn't it? I think it certainly rings some bells. Uh, again, though, I, it's, I, again, I think what we might see is a forerunning event organizationally, not necessarily a vaccination, okay? And, and let me continue to make this uh, point to you, okay? Because what we're seeing, you know, no business or commerce can happen on earth without this mark, yes, but this is also a global governance, okay? Which I think we could, you know, we know that it's fair to say that most people understand that global elites are truly uh, trying to push us in that direction. There is also a global currency. Now, 
that's a, a more questions that have been coming in as well to me because you know if the dollar collapses what will happen then well obviously there will be a global economic reset if the United States is dollar collapses now how close are we to that I don't know that we are necessarily too close to that however I will say you know for years and years uh, I was talking to a couple of uh, pastor friends of, of mine this morning and I can't remember which one said it but you know uh, or I'd, I'd, I'd give them a shout out but one of them said you know there is uh, for years and years we have lived our lives in this nation and thought you know why is America not mentioned in Bible prophecy? How can America, the most powerful nation in the history of the world, the world's leading exporter of Christianity historically, how can it not make it into Bible prophecy, right? Why are we not there? What happens to America where we're not mentioned? And there's a lot of different conjectures on that. But I will say, you know, I think that we, have we not all seen in these last few weeks how, how invincible we, it, we felt just a few weeks ago to where we are today in regards to how fragile our economy truly is. I mean, we're all at home on home orders. I mean, we're this close away from martial law all over a, a, a virus. A virus? The great America, this great mega power nation, and a virus has, has done this to us in such a short period of time? I, you know, I don't know, just, just talking off the top of my head there. But there will be a global currency as we see here. It's prophesied to come. The mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it away here. I'm, I'm telling you I don't think it's a vaccine. But, well, then what is it? Well, let me give you some information. I'll, 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 I'll throw some stuff at you to see uh, um, for you to chew on. How about that? I'll give you some jerky to chew on. 666, the word mark... The word mark, okay, in the Greek here is the word uh, ragma, karagma, karagma. It means brand or seal, okay? Um, this is important uh, within context to understand. When you first believed, when you first believed, uh, what happened? What did the Holy Spirit do, do? The Holy Spirit sealed your heart, didn't he? He sealed your heart. It's a seal, all right? It's a brand or a seal. Uh, interestingly enough, in Leviticus chapter 19, Deuteronomy chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 49, Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 13, uh, getting marks on your body is prohibited for the Jewish people. Now, keep in mind, during this seven-year uh, period, it, we're dealing specifically with the Jewish people. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. How interesting is it? Uh, you know, I, I feel, I feel, you know, so the Jewish people who follow Torah law, they believe that they're not supposed to get marks and tattoos and that sort of thing on their body. Uh, just the two red switches. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're doing it right. Thank you, Asher. <laughs> the, uh, you're, you're, the Jews are not supposed to get a mar uh, branding on their body. So what does the Antichrist do out of his uh, hatred of the Jews? He tells them to get his mark, not just any mark, but his mark. You know, the old uh, scripture is about tattoos. I have tattoos, many of you guys know. The old scripture is about tattoos and in the Old Testament dealt specifically with Yahweh not wanting his people to get tattooed because all of the other religions of the time, all of the Babylonian religions, they would tattoo the name of their God on them. And the reason they would do that is because they were a servant to their God, okay? They were a servant and or much like a slave to their God. So slaves were tattooed in Egypt, uh, tattooed in Babylon, all for their pagan false gods. So Yahweh said, don't tattoo yourself because by not being tattooed, it's a sign of freedom and liberty, okay? So it was never meant to be a, a, a thing of legalism that certain churches try to hold on to now. It's a sign of liberty, okay? Because they were tattooed for other reasons. Well, here we see the Antichrist wanting everybody to care Carry his brand. Now we've all seen enough Civil War movies to understand that a brand, you know, the hot or you know, I lived grew up out west. You brand cattle. You brand, they would brand slaves. How awful! So the mark karagma is a brand or a seal, and it flies directly in the face of Jewish law during the seven-year period of time that deals directly with 
the Jewish people in the nation of Israel. The number six is the number of a man. Remember 666, six is the number of man. It was the Sabbath day uh, uh, was for man, six days plus one, right? So it's a significant number. So thinking about that, what number, it's the, it's, it's, it is 666, the number of a man. It is the name or number of the beast. So is it your social security number? That's one I heard years ago, too, just on the same line of thinking. Uh, coronavirus vaccine potentially being the mark of the beast, right? Well, it used to be, was your social security number the mark of the beast? What about barcodes? That was another one I heard years ago. What about the barcodes are on everything? You can't buy or sell without the barcode, you know. Uh, what about RFID chips? Now, those are a little bit more interesting because I've read some articles articles that talk about how the technology and those things can actually change your DNA. So I'm not willing to, to rule that one out yet, but, but one thing that we do know is that it's a brand and it's a seal, okay? Uh, so is it all these other things? I don't think so. Remember, it is his number. It is his name. Those are the critical identity issues for the mark of the beast, okay? Also, it's a pledge of loyalty. I believe it's a pledge of loyalty as well. It's his name it's that you're sealing on yourself, branding on yourself, marking on yourself, okay? I believe it's a pledge of loyalty, and I don't believe that it's something that you can accidentally get. For example, um, you know, somebody wants to be safe. They're afraid of the coronavirus. You know, they're a, a God-fearing, blood-bought uh, Christian. They love Jesus, but they get the vaccine because they don't know any better. Are they now damned for an eternity because they got the mark of the beast? I don't think that that demonstrates the heart of God. I think it's something that, that people will have to uh, intentionally get. And the gematria letters in, in Hebrew, uh, gematria letters in Hebrew, uh, Greek and Latin, they all have numerical uh, equivalents, okay? Roman numerals, they add up to 666. Arabic n numbers uh, from 1 through 62 uh, uh, add up to uh, 36, or 36. So there's numbers equated with every letter in these different uh, um, languages, okay? Uh, letters equal numbers, and in the Hebrew, remember, they also equal pictures, okay? If... If, if uh, God, this would, let me just say this, this would be the, fir the only time in the Bible that God used gematria uh, to name somebody, and the only time that he used it, uh, used it to title the Antichrist, okay? Some have tried to uh, use gematria with names in English, and it just doesn't work, okay? Uh, there aren't numeric values to English English letters. I've heard I'm, what I'm getting at is I've heard people try to say the 666. If you add it up in the numbers, uh, it's Ronald Reagan or something like. You've probably maybe heard that before. It just doesn't work like that, guys. Uh, it's true. It's true that six is the number of man. Uh, but let's look at it from another angle here. Uh, I've, got, I've come across something that I find interesting in my study of what is the mark of the beast, uh, the number of a man, the name of a man, so on and so forth, okay? Uh, let's take a look at this. Walid Shabbat uh, is, a, is, is a, a teacher right now. He lives overseas. He lives overseas. His story is that he fell in love with a girl when he was a young man. Uh, he, was in, he was a Muslim. Walid was a Muslim. He fell in love with the girl. His, he was hopeful, a hopeful romantic, uh, fell hard for her. However, she was not a Muslim. As a matter of fact, he came to discover that she was a Christian. Well, as soon as he found that out, the first thing he did was say, um, you know, you know, I think we can turn this back on now, guys. Uh, he, the first thing he said was, well, I'll need you to convert to, uh, uh, to be a Muslim. Okay, so uh, she said, all right, well, I'm not going to do that because I love Jesus and I'm a blood-bought believer, um, but I'll make you a deal. I'll make you a deal. Thank you, bud. Uh, if you will read the Bible, then I'll read the Quran, and afterwards we'll pick one religion or the other. Okay, and I kind of think you probably know where this is going. She honored her uh, side of the deal. He honored his side of the deal and became a Christian. Pretty incredible. So, as a Christian, 
or as a as a, a former Muslim and an Arab reading in the Bible, uh, he read it from a different perspective than we with our Western mindsets often read the, uh, the Bible. And as a matter of fact, uh, even a different perspective than uh, the, the Jewish people would. He was reading it from that Muslim Arab perspective. And when he was on vacation once, he got, got so excited about the Bible, studying the Bible, that he went to uh, to... Uh, in uh, Italy, you can go and visit a, a, a Catholic church that puts on display one of the oldest codexes that we have. There are four main codexes, the Codex Vaticanus, Vaticanus excuse me, that dates back to 350 A.D., Okay, is on display in this Catholic church, and he walked into saw it, and when he looked at, at the scripture, it was open to the page in Revelation, believe it or not, it, in Revelation chapter 13, to the verse about the Antichrist, and he just his jaw dropped when he saw it. He he said that the number will be six six six, and and because he believed that he was looking at this Bible that was written, it was an original translation of the Word of God in Greek, and he believed that he saw Arabic writing in it, and he couldn't believe it. When he looked at that 666, he said, this is Arabic right here. And can I see that uh, first picture? I'm going to share it with you guys. So this is what he saw in the Greek. The number is... Uh, Christos, Antichrist, Pseudo-Christ. You see uh, the X, the little squiggle in the middle, uh, and then the third squiggle. Each, uh, the X is 600. The one that looks like an E is the value of 60. And then there's that last uh, uh, value uh, squiggle that equals 6. And that makes out 666. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Greek words for those. But you see in the highlighted pink area there, that in the Greek is what it looked like in the Vaticanus Codex when Walid looked down and he looked at uh, the Bible page and he said 666 and he said, I'm re that, there, that is Aramaic. Right, or excuse me, not Aramaic. That is, that is Arab writing right there in this Bible. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Can I go to the next picture now? Here's a comparison to what Walid saw. Do you see the first X, the cross swords? The E, the top one is the Arabic. The bottom one is uh, written in the codex. The bottom one, the E, he believes that it was incorrectly because it was written down by John. When John had this vision, he saw it. John didn't speak Arabic. Walid believes the Holy Spirit was showing him that, that uh, John was trying to cipher a language that he didn't even know how to speak, and this is what he wrote. Can I see the next picture? <coughs> there it is. There's the sample from the actual codex. Okay. So do you see how similar... That looks now. Look at all of this Arabic writing. This, those three letters in Arabic, if it is indeed Arabic, okay, uh, simply reads is the phrase in the name of Allah, or it's the symbol of Islam. Oh, church, we remember from Genesis chapter uh, 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, right? Or from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the world. What world political system treats women worse than Islam? Hmm? I don't know. Many believe that the Antichrist is to come out of Rome, and there is good reason for that. But remember <coughs> how the Roman Empire stretched all the way through Turkey and Syria and down to Israel. And it, when the Roman Empire was separated, it split. Constantinople became the capital of the Roman Empire. Constantinople, which is in modern-day Turkey, goes by the name of Istanbul. Uh, I don't know, church. Uh, could, could an Antichrist come out of an Islamic region yet still be Greek? I think the answer to that is yes. Can I see the next picture? On the right arm, they wear this symbol. You see the symbol right there? In the name of Allah. On the right arm, where else do they wear this symbol? Can I see the next picture? On their foreheads. Traditionally, uh, jihadi uh, Muslim soldiers will wear that badge 
when Walid saw it in the Vatican, uh, Vaticanus Codex, it jumped off the page at him because what he saw as a former Muslim and Arab was in the name of Allah on the right hand or on the forehead. I think that's pretty compelling, you know. Uh, is that the last picture? Do we have any more? That's the last one. Wonderful. Uh, so, t you know, church, look into this yourself. Like I said, whenever I teach something, I want it to be just, you know, I want to give you something for you to jump off into. Uh, like, you know, I can't read you the whole study of Walid's, but look him up. It's an incredible study. You know, many believe that, as I said, the Antichrist is to come out of Rome, and there's good reason for that, okay? Uh, the, you know, Greek in, uh, in uh, the anti in Greek means over, it means against, okay? It means, so antichrist would be over or against or instead of Christ. Interesting that in Latin, the Pope is referred to as the vicar of Christ, which literally means in the place of Christ is the title that the Pope assumes himself as being Christ on earth, not against Christ, but in the place of Christ is what Antichrist means. So, you know, uh, all of that being said, all of that being said, let me back up here. Mark, so what did we re find out in Revelation chapter 13? One world religion, one world order, mark of the beast, all of this stuff. Uh, uh, is that what we're seeing right now? Or is that what this vaccine is, the mark and all of this stuff? Let me ask you one more uh, question in summary here, okay? Let me ask you, when do these things happen in Revelation? It's chapter 13, right? So let me ask you again. Is chapter 13 before or after chapter 4 when there's a rapture event? After, right? So I believe, I believe that there is a, a rapture event coming and all of these things that a lot of people might be afraid of right now think they might be seeing happen. Fear not, church. You are not seeing the mark of the beast right now. You're not going to be take it, forced to take a vaccine and it be the mark of the beast, I believe. In my opinion, okay, uh, I do not believe that we are seeing a, uh, uh, the setting up of the global cur uh, one world currency religion and order right now. Now, I believe we're seeing a run up to it. I think that things are, we, we're, what we're witnessing are, is that things are definitely heading that direction and fast. As we look around the world, we see uh, nations aligned for the first time in history that have to be aligned for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. The prophecies of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, we know that that's a war, an end time war that's going to happen. And here we have in this day and age, uh, we have, we have those nations aligned and allied for the first time in history. The third prophesied third nation of Israel was born in 1948 and is here now. The end times cannot come until there's a third kingdom of Israel, and it is here right now, church. Okay, um, so th that's where we're at. Okay, and you're not you're not. Uh, you're not wrong for asking, is this it? Is this the end? As you're not wrong for worrying about that. The disciples worried about that. As a matter of fact, I want to close in Matthew chapter 24 tonight, okay? Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked Jesus himself when these things were going to happen. So let's read Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 through 15. Now, as he sat... On the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Okay? Uh, some translations in the Bible say, at, in the end of the world, okay? You see, I specifically used uh, uh, the New King James Version Bible here because that word is eon, which means age. Okay, the Essian people believed in dispensations, and as we study the Word of God, we see that there were, you know, there was a period of the uh, the Essians believed there were four dispensations. There was a period of time known as chaos that was during creation. Then there was the time of Torah uh, in the Jews, and then there's the age of grace, which we are currently in, which is the interval of Daniel uh, chapter nine before the seventieth week begins. Okay, but then once that happens, the fourth age is going to be a thousand year millennial reign 
We're looking forward, church, to a seven-year tribulation, and then after that, when Jesus returns and puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives, that will begin a thousand-year millennial reign, and it's going to be the best time ever, okay? Uh, uh, Ken Johnson was teaching on this the other night, and I love it. He, he mentioned it, and he just said, it's going to be the best time ever, okay? Uh, those who know Dr. Ken Johnson, uh, he's a, or a the, uh, theologian, a uh, wonderful teacher. In any case, so that's what we're looking for. So those different, those four different ages, okay? So they, that's what they're ask, asking. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Not the end of the world, or, the, or you know, that's not, that's a, not for at least another 1,007 years uh, away if the tribulation started today, okay? So it's not the end of the world Completely, maybe as you know it, once we get raptured. But let's keep reading. Verse 4. And Jesus answered them. You want to know what he said, don't you? He said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Perhaps I am in the place of Christ. I don't know. But they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled. Somebody underline that. So many in the world right now need to just not be troubled by what's going on right now. And put your hope in Jesus. It's the only, it's the only place you can put your hope and you won't be let down. Okay? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not Yet, for nation will rise against nation, that's ethnic group against ethnic group, and kingdom against kingdom. You know, uh, an interesting uh, conjecture here is, you know, we think of kingdoms against kingdoms. Yeah, so like Russia and China and the United States and Israel and all that, perhaps, but could this potentially be referring to heavenly kingdoms and the kingdom, uh, uh, spiritual kingdoms of Satan? There will be warring in the spirit as well during this seven-year tribulation period. And don't you know there is spiritual warfare going on right now just beyond our vision. We can certainly feel it, can't we? Let's keep reading. And there will be famines. There will be pestilences, right? There's that word, that pestilences that includes plagues and viruses and sickness, insects, that sort of thing. And earthquakes in various places, okay? Uh, the other translation says divers places, right? Places where earthquakes don't normally happen. And then verse 8 tells us that all, when all of these things happen, these are the beginnings of sorrows. Or another way to say that would be birth pains. As a woman is about to give birth, she begins to have birth pains. Is the earth itself going through these birth pains, the beginning of these things, not the culmination of these things, but just the beginning of sorrows, the beginnings of birth pains. Uh, inter interesting note here. Arrhenius, early church father Arrhenius, believed that Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, which refers to an explosion of knowledge in the end times, he believed that, it, uh, that that explosion was linked to the founding of the third kingdom of Israel and would be the beginning of said sorrows. He actually said this. Can we see his quote? He said, Daniel the prophet says, shut up these words and seal the book even to the time of consummation. Until many learn and knowledge be completed, for at that time, here it is, when the dispersion shall be accomplished, they shall know all things. When was the dispersion accomplished? In 1948, church. When the, when the Aaliyah was called and all of the, the Jewish people returned to their homeland and the third kingdom of Israel was established again. Interestingly enough, church, uh, and you're going to like this, uh, Isaiah chapter 29 also links the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948, the same time, the same time that uh, uh, Israel was re reborn. In Isaiah chapter 29, it talks about a, uh, a Israel being uh, persecuted and punished, but then there will be a war, and it'll be a quick war. And then verse 4 says this, verse 4 out of Isaiah chapter 29 says, You shall speak out of the ground, your speech shall be low out of the dust, your voice shall sound like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper 
out of the dust. How cool is that? That perhaps these books that Daniel was told to seal up were discovered in 1948 in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the same year that that prophesied uh, um, kingdom of Israel came to be, and Arrhenius believed that the beginnings of sorrows started. So if they started in 48, they're only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until the birth happens, right? So we're going to see these uh, beginnings of sorrows, these birth pains get worse and worse and worse right up until the end, right up until we bump into the beginning of that seven-year tribulation. Let's keep reading. Then, Jesus said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and, and you will be hated by all nations for my sake. And again, here we see a dual nature a prophecy here, just like we saw back in Daniel, okay? A dual natured prophecy in Daniel, dual natured prophecy in Matthew 24, I believe, okay? Uh, I believe he's prophesying of the, uh, uh, well, uh, let me just keep reading. Uh, verse 10, and then many will be offended. I love, I underlined that because boy, do, does that not ring true with us today? I, to the, in this day and age, it, it seems like people are so easily offended. It, it feels like more than ever, people are looking for a reason to be offended, especially if you bring up politics, right? They will betray one another and they will hate one another at this time. Then many false prophets False prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because the lawlessness will abound, does it feel like lawlessness is abounding in our, in our halls of Congress these days? Uh, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Verse 13, this is for you, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end. And the word end there is, is telos, always of the end of some act or state, but not of the end of a period of time. Okay, so this is the end of those things that were happening, he said. It will come. Okay, and verse 15, let's keep reading. Therefore, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand this. I think this is important to, to include into that last passage of scripture, church, because Jesus here, you know, there's a lot of people, Daniel, the prophecy uh, that comes to us through the book of Daniel is so spot on and so accurate that many scholars simply say there's no way that it could be true. It must be some sort of forgery that came to us in the 1500s. That's, that's all, there, all it could be uh, because uh, Daniel chapter 5 so accurately details the, 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 the rise and fall of Alexander the Great and the four nations that would come after and, and all of that. Uh, it's just so accurately details history uh, from the past it's a, it's a living book of prophecy. Well, Jesus himself, so, so scoffers today say, there's no way Daniel was, is a credible uh, historical uh, book. It's too accurate. Well, Jesus himself here validates Daniel as a prophet and links his statement, uh, links his statement to him and the 70th week right there. So Jesus says, just to wrap all this up, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. It's the 70th week. He's talking of the seven-year tri tribulation. He's drawing a straight line from what he's telling the disciples here all the way back to Daniel. So what we're seeing is the duality of this prophecy. The duality that this prophecy is referring to, the destruction of the temple, uh, both, in da both in Daniel chapter 9 and in Matthew chapter 24. It's referring to that, but it is also referring to the seven-year tribulation period of the end. Here we are, church, okay? In conclusion, 
In conclusion, you know, it's been a, a long, uh, long study. We covered a lot of ground. I encourage you guys to go back and rewatch this. Take notes, dig in. If you've got questions, send them to me. I'd love to talk about it. There's so much more that I, I could have shared and wanted to share, but for time's sake, have left out. Maybe we'll get to it next week. Maybe we'll just do a whole s a s series on this one time and just go down the rabbit hole. I don't know. In conclusion, in conclusion, okay, is this the end of the world, church, as we know it, this coronavirus, this uh, um, quarantine stuff, this, it, no, it is, this is not the pale horse rider right now, okay? Is the COVID-19 COVID the pale horse rider? No. Is this the tribulation? Are we in the seven-year period right now? No. Is this the beginning of sorrows, though? I believe it is. I think it is. Church, I believe that we're living in the period of history that the Bible speaks about more than any other time. Uh, more than any other time, the Bible talks about the end times. And I believe that in 1948 began a ramping of the beginning of sorrows. We're, uh, are we not seeing earthquake, earthquakes in strange places, church? Are we, are we not seeing uh, locust outbreaks? Now, look, there are, there are always different locust outbreaks in different parts of the world, okay? Because that's just part of the sorrows, okay? It's in moments, uh, moments like this. Uh, Ken Johnson, in his teaching that I, I watched uh, the other night, he said, you know, it's, really this should call us to, to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ in other parts of the country because things like uh, 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 virus outbreaks think, uh, happen around the world because these are sorrows, okay? And the sorrows, yeah, they, they may be ramping, church, they may be ramping, but that doesn't mean that we're in the tribulation and that this is the seven-year tribulation that we're in it and that's the pale horse rider and, and this and that and the seals are being opened and everything else. The seals will be opened one day, but you've got to remember that it is Jesus himself who opens those seals when that judgment comes down on the earth. And is he going to let his bride be here when that judgment comes down, when that wrath pours out? I believe no. I don't believe that, uh, that the groom would beat the heck out of his bride before he marries her. Uh, <laughs> that's how my wife loves to say it. I've always loved that saying. I don't believe that he would do that. And I, I also know that he promises us that we are not subject to wrath. And that's a direct promise from him. Uh, that I don't have the reference for for you. But in any case, church, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. I believe that these, these are the sorrows that are leading up to the end. I do believe that the hour is late and that the night is darkest before the dawn, but I believe the dawn of Jesus returning and calling us up is coming and it's coming quickly and I hope that your heart is ready. So I hope you're encouraged tonight. I hope any fears that you might have had have been kind of put to bed by understanding of the prophecy in context. And uh, I think let's it would be best if we just end in prayer tonight. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that, that we're not, uh, uh, we're not uh, meant to be afraid, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that, uh, that you see those who are fearful. You see those that don't understand what's going on and why it's going on. Lord, I just pray right now that you would encourage their hearts, Father. Those who are being drawn to you right now in a way that they never have, even though it may be because of fear. Maybe they're buying the Bibles off the shelves, Lord, uh, because they've never cracked it open. Uh, but and it's straight out of fear. I, for whatever the reason is, they're, they're uh, trying to, to come to you in your word, Lord. I pray that you, just, you would reveal yourself to them in a way that you never Ever have, Father. I pray that you would enable us, Lord, uh, your workers of the harvest of the field, Father, uh, to to be effective, to have the words to speak, have the the knowledge and the understanding of your words uh, of your word, Lord, to to be a comfort to those that are in fear or in a, a, a time of confusion, God. Whether it be because of the sickness or their fear of the sickness or their fear of the financial fallout, whatever it is, we just ask that you would bless this nation. We pray for our president in the name of Jesus. We lift up Donald Trump, President Trump, Lord, and his leadership team, Father. Give him wisdom. 
wisdom and discernment, Lord, and heal our nation, heal our land, heal all those that are sick with the coronavirus, the COVID-19, Father. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus, God. We pray that the medicine that they began testing yesterday, Father, would be successful in defeating it and treating it, God, that our nation, Father, would, would return to uh, a financial uh, stability and that your people would be cared for and we would continue to be uh, able to be the world's leading, uh, uh, leading uh, outsourcer of the gospel. We just thank you for who you are, Lord. Continue to enlighten our hearts and open our minds to your word. In Jesus' name, we love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Sunday morning, we're going to be back at it. We'll do a little worship again next uh, this next Sunday, 1030, is serv when service time starts. So join us again live from your living room. I hope this time has been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. Uh, we love you guys. Thanks so much.